I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation. Today we're going to be talking about attachment theory and its implications for treatment. I am your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this presentation, and if you downloaded the PowerPoint, you know I went a little bit crazy. I shortened the presentation so we can get it into the hour, but there are additional slides after that of other information that I just thought was so juicy or, or useful or whatever you want to say that I left it left the slides there. So if you want additional information that's not included in your test, um, you can go and look at the lengthy PowerPoint that is in your classroom. Today we're just going to cover the first 29 slides and we're going to review attachment theory for those of you who need a little brush up on it. Identify stages of distress that a person experiences when there is a threat to their attachment. Discuss the benefits of secure attachment. Explore the effects of insecure attachment. Learn about different attachment styles and their associated problems. And hypothesize interventions to create secure attachment regardless of age. And I'll jump ahead, a little foreshadowing here. Even Bowlby agreed that attachment style can be intervened with or can be fixed, if you will, in adults, even if their primary attachment wasn't there. So it's not a lost cause. Attention therapists, All CEUs is grateful to our new sponsor, the Diversion Center. They offer workbooks that are 100% editable and delivered to you in a Word document on topics including anger management, substance use disorders, domestic violence, parenting, and shoplifting addiction. Each workbook can be used for individual or group sessions and is over 120 pages. You have the option to add or remove content, insert your name as the author, and reprint and resell the workbooks to your clients. Go to privatelabelworkbooks.com and take advantage of their buy one, get one free bundle offers. Remember, that's privatelabelworkbooks.com. Attachment is the quality of the relationship with the caregiver characterized by trust, safety, and security. Okay, this is our first relationship. This is our relationship when we are helpless little critters. We can't even figure out how to get our hand to our mouth at this point. That comes a little bit later. If you've been around, you know, newborn infants, that whole coordination with the limbs doesn't happen necessarily right away. We can't feed ourselves. We can't go grocery shopping. We can't keep a roof over our head. We can't even dress ourselves. So we are dependent upon some other figure to provide for our safety and security. So we are hardwired to need to connect, create some sort of a bond with that figure who is going to provide our safety and security. Now, Bowlby always referred to it as the mother. And some other research has indicated, and I think many of us could hypothesize, it does not have to be the biological mother of the infant. If the infant receives that consistent caregiving that we're going to talk about from a primary caregiver, male, female, mother, foster parent, whomever, if it is a consistent, stable caregiver that meets that child's needs, then that will, could be considered the primary attachment, but it has to happen within a particular window. The quality of the infant parent attachment or infant caregiver attachment is a powerful predictor of a child's later social and emotional outcome. Again, this is true if there are no interventions. If there is a problem with the child caregiver attachment, for example, my first child was a micropreemie. He was in the hospital for almost two months after he was born. So I wasn't able to take him home for the first couple of weeks. I wasn't even able to get him out of the incubator. So there was a lot of that normal bonding that happens that he wasn't able to experience because he was so preemie. So does that mean that he is doomed to a social and emotional outcomes that are going to be negative later on? Not necessarily. However, if that infant parent attachment is not rectified or if there aren't interventions put in place as soon as possible, then you could see reverberating outcomes after that. 
Attachment is determined by the caregiver's response to the infant when the infant's attachment system is activated. So when the, when the infant is hungry, angry, well, I guess angry doesn't work. That's, that's addiction. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. But same sort of thing for, for infants. If they're cold, if they are too hot, if they are hungry, if they're scared, if they're tired, they are going to, that attachment system is going to activate. Something is needed. They are not okay right now. And they cry. If you've been around infants, you know that infants have unique cries for different states that they're in. And a lot of the cries sound similar between children. I can be in Walmart to this day and I can hear a kid fussing and can identify whether it's an angry fussing or a sleepy fussing. Now, the others tend to be a little bit grayer for me. But you can generally pick up on that tone if you've been around it and your infant has trained you, so to speak. Beginning at six months old, infants come to anticipate caregivers' responses to their distress and shape their own behaviors accordingly. Okay, this I didn't know when I was, you know, a young parent. <clears throat> Children who interact with a responsive caregiver will lovingly greet that caregiver. Children who are gr greeted by a caregiver who is either unresponsive or irritable or angry <clears throat> may de develop strategies for dealing with the stress in the presence of that, that caregiver. A lot of times with infants, if they are overstimulated by this caregiver or intimidated or, or is an unpleasant interaction, the child will yawn, the child will avert their gaze, and do a lot of things to not make that connection in a nonverbal sort of way, because obviously they're not verbal yet. If the caregiver responds sensitively and is responsive to the child's needs, it doesn't just mean when the child cries, I pick it up and I give it a bottle. It's responsive to the child's needs. So when the child cries, I, as the caregiver, am able to understand what the child needs and meet that need. So when it's cold, I am getting it dressed when it's too hot it's take, i'm taking its little booties off so he's it's not cold my son used to get hot all the time and oh boy would he get get fussy if the caregiver is responsive to the child's needs and is loving towards the child is nurturing towards the child holds the child then the child will develop a secure attachment Again, if you've been around infants, you know that they are, and it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint, they are perceptive little critters. Even, you know, itty-bitty infants, if you are afraid to hold them, they're going to tense up as well. If you are holding them and you are angry, they tend to get fussier as well. Um, my son, again, when he was little, after he came home, he had gastric reflux really bad, and we would walk around the house with him for hours trying to help him calm down and go to sleep before we discovered the wonders of Zantac. But I digress. My husband and I learned very early on that when we started feeling ourselves reaching that frustration point, it was time to hand off the baby because if we continued to walk with him after that, he picked up on it and he would actually escalate in his fussiness and irritability. Anyhow, children are extremely perceptive of nonverbal signals, um, pheromones, who knows? I don't know how they understand it all, but they understand more than we think. Children who interact with a caregiver who is insensitive, rejecting, or inconsistent may become very insecure in their attachment. They're not sure if Jekyll or Hyde's going to show up to change their diaper. They're not sure if caregiver is going to show up at all. If you have a caregiver who is clinically depressed, is struggling with postpartum depression, and remember both, it doesn't, it's not just the biological mother who experiences postpartum depression. It can be prevalent in both, both parents, even if both, even if neither parent is a biological caregiver, because of the stresses of a new baby and the lack of sleep and everything else that goes with it. That's in my presentation on postpartum depression, so I'm not going to go there. However, my point is that the caregiver 
any caregiver can be secure or insecure in its relationship with the, with the infant. The primary attachment figure remains crucial for approximately the first two years of life. Well, let's think about it. What happens during the first two years? At the end of two years, little Tommy is able to walk a little bit more. Little Tommy's probably in preschool or daycare or going over to friends' houses or something. So there is more of a world that Tommy, little Tommy can connect with. The first two years of life, little Tommy is really dependent on that usually on that one caregiver or one or two caregivers. Forming this attachment is almost useless, emphasis on almost, if delayed until after two and a half to three years. So if you have a child that bounces around in foster care for the first two or three years of their life, they're probably going to struggle with a lot of emotional and behavioral issues because this attachment is just never established. Or, heaven forbid, if in early childhood, maybe attachment starts to get established the first couple of months, and then that primary caregiver dies or goes away for some reason. That also breaks that attachment. There are a lot of things that can disrupt this attachment relationship. If the attachment figure is broken or disrupted between the ages of one and five, the child may suffer irreversible, according to Bifulco, Irreversible long-term con consequences. Women who had lost their caregiver through separation or death doubled their risk of depressive and anxiety disorders. The rate of depression was highest in women whose caregivers had died before the child reached the age of six. That was one study. It had a fairly big uh, sample size. True. I don't know personally whether I agree, agree with the term irreversible. I would want to look and at these people and talk to them more and say what sort of interventions happened if you're a child you know a three four year old and your mom dies and it was the love of your dad's life or, or what have you then dad may experience a lot of grief a lot of extra stress not knowing how to take care of kids there's a lot of other stuff that happens as a result of losing that primary caregiver if on the other hand the primary, care, primary caregiver goes away, dies, goes to jail, whatever, and is, the child is met with another consistent primary caregiver. Can the effects of that separation from the initial primary caregiver, can that be buffered? I don't know the answer to that, but those are things that I would want to look at before I would say that you know, if this doesn't happen in the first five years, it's irreversible, you're out of luck. What do you think? Do you think if parents are, or caregivers, are separated from their child, do you think the child's, the, the consequences the child experiences are irreversible? Let's continue to think about that. Remember during this first five years, if you think back to Erickson, you have trust, mistrust, and I put them over here in the corner for those of you who haven't reviewed Erickson in a while. You have trust, mistrust. That's when the baby's an infant. Are you going to feed me, clothe me, keep me warm? Autonomy versus shame. This is that whole starting to toilet train age and initiative versus guilt when they're starting to go to preschool trying to dress themselves they go through the terrible twos and even worse threes and start trying to assert some independence during this time children are really trying to explore and trying to master their own bodies their thinking during this time is also dichotomous it's all or nothing which is why children who are abused during this stage have such a hard time understanding 
what's going on because either mom loves me or she hates me. And there, there's no gray area. There's no mom's angry because of something else. It's all or nothing. So if mom's beating me, then she must hate me, which means I must be bad. You know, children think very dichotomously and very egocentrically. Everything that happens is because of them. So if mom's in a bad mood, it must be something I did. It's not, oh, you know, dad came home late again. The kid's thinking, what did I do? During this phase, when the, they're forming this relationship, this is how they're thinking. It's all about me. It's either all or nothing. And can I trust? Yes or no? It's not a sometimes. It's a yes or no. Children's attachment with their primary caregiver leads to the development of an internal working model which guides future interactions with others. Oh, my gosh. So if a child is in an environment in which the caregiver is um, inconsistent, the one person who was responsible for making sure that they were fed, clothed, safe, all that kind of stuff, they created this internal working model this is what they expect from everybody else because that one person is the one who was above all supposed to be the ideal relationship, so to speak, the way we're wired. So now the child has this internal working model that all people are inconsistent, that nobody is trustworthy. Remember, we're using those dichotomous words again, all, nothing, nobody. Three main features of the internal working model, a model of others as being trustworthy or not. No gray area. A model of the self as valuable or not. If I'm valuable, then I get taken care of. If I'm not valuable, then I don't get taken care of. A model of the self as effective when interacting with others. Can I interact, can I ask caregiver a question and get an answer, or can I, when I ask caregiver a question, do I get yelled at? Can I ask caregiver to play with me? because I want to play cars or something, or when I ask caregiver to play with me, am I always told to go away? So am I effective at interacting with others, and do people want to be around me? And looking at some of your, your comments about whether Attachment issues in early childhood are reversible or irreversible. Uh, most of you seem to be indicating that it's probably not irreversible in most cases. If the person works through their attachment, attachment trauma, and when you take into account their personality factors and other protective factors that were out there, So what problems might lack of a primary attachment figure or a good primary attachment relationship in infancy cause in childhood? You have this child that's growing up thinking people are not trustworthy, I am not worthy, and I'm not capable of interacting with others, or I can't effectively get my needs met. What's that going to look like in childhood, elementary school? One thing we see a lot with children, especially in, as they get older, when they start to feel overwhelmed, sometimes they will act out in order to get limits set, in order to get structure. If the child came from a chaotic environment, an inconsistent environment where they never learned how to self-soothe and all that kind of stuff, then they're likely going to have trouble controlling their emotions and impulses in new environments or when they start to get stressed so they can present as more of a behavior problem. In adulthood, you still have that, unless people have addressed it and really looked back and, you know, worked through those issues, you still have that 
ineffective internal working model of what relationships and what people are like. So it creates problems in attaching to other adults. And it creates problems in later parenting because we learned, we learned what we lived a lot of times. Adult attachment style refers to systematic patterns of expectations, beliefs, and emotions concerning the availability and responsiveness of close, close others during times of distress, often among multiple people with one primary attachment. So a lot of times we have a best friend, or we're still really close with our primary caregiver, or we have a spouse that we are really close to. However, in the adult world, we often have multiple people. We're not reliant on that one person to meet our every single need, which is awesome. However, it can also be, it can also be challenging because if those people in our attachment circle, if any of them become inconsistent, then it can start making you question other relationships. Adult attachment, as opposed to child attachment, is bi-directional child attachment the child needs the, the caregiver provides one one direction in adult attachment one person needs the other person provides and then later on in the week it may go the other way around so in adult attachment it's a give-and-take relationship What might cause other than secure attachments in adults? You know, again, they could have even had a decent or even very good upbringing. I have a lot of clients who come in and they're t talking to me and they're like, you know what, Dr. Snipes, I had a great life growing up. You know, my parents were good. School was good. I wasn't bullied. I got decent grades. And yet I'm here. And we want to start looking at what changed. Maybe you did have this idyllic childhood. I don't know. Maybe you're just remembering that way, remembering it that way. Again, I don't know. But what types of things in adult relationships can shake that internal working model? Getting into a relationship that's domestically violent can certainly shake that internal working model because it, that relationship by its very nature breaks people down. You'll learn in a few minutes, development of mental health issues can shake secure attachments in adults because sometimes our significant others don't know how to support us when we're in a crisis, when you've got somebody with PTSD or with a personality disorder or bipolar disorder. It can make it more difficult for that person to find other people who understand and can be supportive and consistent in the way that they need. They found that psychological problems can increase attachment insecurity. Davila et al. found that late adolescent women who became less securely attached over a period of six to 24 more, uh, over a period of six to 24 months were more likely than their peers to have a history of psychopathology. So they looked and they found as the mood disorder increased, the, the depression, the anxiety increased in intensity, severity, the relationships tended to become more unstable. Whether that was because the support of others didn't know how to respond or whether it was because the identified patient was pushing people away and withdrawing that wasn't explained in the, in the study. However, there was a distinct relationship between the two. Another study found that among soldiers with PTSD, attachment anxiety and avoidance increase over time, and the increases are predicted by the severity of PT, PTSD symptoms. Well, think about all the symptoms of PTSD. Avoidance, emotional numbing, distancing, flashbacks, hypervigilance. It can be exhausting to be around others and they may fear bad things happening to those who love them they may feel ineffective in relationships because they're having difficulty managing their own feelings there's a lot of reasons why you can see or 
how somebody with PTSD that's uncontrolled may start to see a deterioration in the quality of their relationships. So these are things that we're going to talk about in just a second on, on what we can do. Three progressive stages of distress. Now, typically we talk about this with children, but you can parallel what adults would do. There's the protest stage. The child cries, screams, and protests angrily when the caregiver leaves. They will try to cling on to the caregiver to stop them leaving. Now, in adult relationships, we don't typically protest quite this much. However, when a relationship breaks up, for example, that can be another trigger for a protest. The second step is despair. The protesting begins to stop and the child appears to be calmer, although still upset. The child refuses others' attempts for comfort and often seems withdrawn in, and uninterested in anything. Think about adult relationships. That breakup happens, you cry, you try to make it stop, whatever, and then you settle into that grieving despair period. And then finally, detachment. If separation continues, the child will start to engage with other people again. They will reject the caregiver on their return and show strong signs of anger. Think of it like a grieving process. Denial, anger, depression, acceptance. When somebody is securely attached, and I want you to think and, and suggest ways how can we help people learn basic trust, which serves as a basis for all future emotional relationships? The first thing, you know, depending on when their attachment relationship was disrupted, they have to learn to trust themselves. They have to learn to trust their own feelings, their own spidey senses, their own thoughts as being real and valid and informative. Basic trust is something that I think I work on with probably 80% of my clients. The second is to develop fulfilling intimate relationships. And this can be between friends. It doesn't have to be a sexual thing. But develop these fulfilling relationships that are close where you can share your deepest, darkest feelings and you can ask for help and not feel like you're going to be rejected. Maintain emotional balance. There are a lot of ways to do that. You can go with Linehan's DBT. You can go with um, acceptance and commitment therapy. You can go with any ver cognitive behavioral, any variety of tools to help people balance. And remember that being happy and maintaining emotional balance is not just about taking away the bad. If you take away the bad, but there isn't any good to replace it, then the person's just kind of flat. So we need to help them add in some good and... Learn how to deal with the stress. And Allison points out that a lack of nutrition may contribute to the ability to process emotions. And you're getting right ahead of me because that is Tuesday's class. We're going to talk about the impact of gut health on mental health. We need to help people feel confident and, and good about themselves. So self-esteem activities. They need to enjoy being with others. Now, you've got introverts who, you know, like my husband and my daughter, they, they don't dislike people, but too many people is overwhelming for them. So they just want to hang out with one or two people at a time. When then you've got people who are extroverts like me, and I'm just like, hey, let's go to the gym and work out with 40 other people, and that's where I draw my energy. Wherever the person is, we want them to enjoy connecting with some other people because we want them to establish those attachment relationships. Remember, they're multiple in adulthood. Help people rebound from disappointment and loss, share their feelings and seek support, and explore the environment with feelings of safety and security, which leads to healthy intellectual and social development. For a child, when they go to explore, and even when they're learning to walk or something, they may walk and then they fall on their bum and then they, they look back at caregiver and if caregiver responds in a comforting way then they're like okay you know whatever i can try that again uh, when kids go for their first recital or whatever caregivers are often there in the front row to cheer somebody on or just to support them because they know that the child is might be scared out of their wits 
providing that support when the child is exiting the comfort zone to try to explore and expand their universe, but providing a safe home base that the person can come back to, even if it goes bad, and where they feel loved despite the fact that things went bad, that whole unconditional positive regard thing. We want to help people develop the ability to control their behavior, which results in effective management of impulses and emotions. When children are little, we are not born with coping skills. We are not born with the stress tolerance skills. So when we are exposed to a situation where we don't have anybody to teach us that, to help us learn to manage our emotions, to tell us, all right, little Johnny, I need you to just take a breath. It's going to be okay. Or why don't you walk around the room for a few times or whatever your, your particular child does in order to de-escalate. When we don't have somebody to teach us those skills, we don't learn them, which leads to adults who emotionally dysregulate because they don't have any tools to figure out how to turn down the temperature, turn down the heat, which means we develop adults who have difficulty managing their emotions and their impulses to that go along with those emotions. When I get angry, I'm going to punch a wall. Well, ideally, we help people learn strategies early on to modulate their anger so they don't feel so angry they need to punch a wall, but they have skills and tools to deal with it if they start feeling angry enough to punch a wall, you know, have them recognize that they don't want to, what else can I do? I can punch a punching bag. I can go for a run. What else can I do? We want people to have a... Cre we want people to create a foundation for the development of identity, which includes a sense of capability, self-worth, and a balance between dependence and independence. Attachment means recognizing that we can't do it all on our own. We do rely on other people for emotional support, for connection, for you know, help getting something off the top shelf if you're short like me, whatever it is. We feel good about ourselves for the skills and tools that we have, but we don't feel bad about ourselves because we're not perfect at everything. We accept the fact that we've got strengths, other people have strengths, and we can syn synergize and use those strengths, as Covey would say, in order to help us both succeed. Secure attachment also helps people establish a moral framework that leads to empathy, compassion, and conscience. When people are securely attached, they have somewhere they can go to bounce ideas off of. Is this right? Is this fair? Is this whatever? And it helps them establish a sense of right and wrong. Helps them generate a core set of beliefs and provides a defense against stress and trauma. Especially when, when kids are younger, and I say younger, my daughter's a teenager, and I'm still finding myself having to do it for her, saying, you know what? I think you need a break. She's one of those who will push and push and push. And I'm like, you know, little girl, I love you to death. However, the world is not going to end if you don't do these 17 things before the end of the year. And I love you despite the fact that you didn't get those things done. You know, it's, I love you for you and you, you get it done or not. And that provides a lot of defense against stress and trauma because of that unconditional positive regard. And then when people receive it, they learn to give it to themselves. They learn to say, you know what? I'm okay. Even though I'm not perfect, I'm okay. Securely attached adults tend to have positive views of themselves, their partners, and their relationships because that internal working model is trustworthy, valuable, and effective at communicating. They also view others as being trustworthy, valuable, and effective, oops, sorry, and effective at communicating. They feel comfortable with intimacy and independence and are able to balance the two. They don't have to be enmeshed in their relationships. They don't have to be completely disengaged. They are comfortable sharing and relying, but are also able to be themselves. They exchange support within their inner circle or secure relationships. This includes providing one another respect, encouragement, somebody to confide in, 
somewhere to get reassurance, sick care, the ability to talk about one's health or things that worry or upset them. Think about the things that you talk about with your primary best friend, whomever that is, if it's your partner or your best friend forever, whoever. What types of things do you talk about with that person and what types of things does that person provide for you? My guess is several of them are listed here. With somebody's insecurely attached, it causes problems. Attachment insecurity can be viewed as a general vulnerability to mental disorders with a particular symptomatology depending on genetic, developmental, and environmental factors. Attachment insecurity has been linked to depression, clinically significant anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress, suicidal tendencies, and eating disorders. Let's look at those for a second. Depression. Well, the, one of the key features of depression is feeling hopeless and helpless. If you don't believe that the world is trustworthy, if you don't believe that you're worthy of love, if you don't believe that you will ever be effective at getting your needs met and communicating, then yeah, I can see where you might feel hopeless and helpless. So I can see where that could contribute to feelings of depression. Additionally, early trauma and lack of a secure attachment has been characterized as early trauma can alter the actual brain of people that can produce neurochemical imbalances that can lead to depression can we help them develop a workaround later and manage certainly it is important to realize that depression doesn't necessarily can Depression doesn't necessarily come from um, just feeling hopeless and helpless. It actually can come from the traumatic event of the separation. Lack of parental sensitivity and responsiveness contributes to disorders of the self, characterized by lack of self-cohesion. You don't really know who you are. You know, you're, just, you're kind of a chameleon out there. Doubts about one's internal coherence and continuity over time. Who was I? Who am I? Who do you want me to be? An unstable self-esteem and over-dependence on other people's approval. If you don't feel worthy, then you're looking for other people to tell you that you're, you're worthy, which creates a really unhealthy dynamic when you rely on other people to tell you that you're good enough to breathe the air. In 1988, Bowlby acknowledged that attachment patterns are difficult to change in adulthood, although not impossible. Go Bowlby. According to attachment theory, interactions with inconsistent, unreliable, or insensitive attachment figures interfere with the development of a secure, stable mental foundation, reduce resilience in coping with stressful life events. Resilience is our ability to bounce back. Well, how do we bounce back? We bounce back if we feel loved. We bounce back if we feel supported. You know, you throw a ball. If it doesn't hit a wall, it ain't going to bounce back. So if we feel, feel supported, if we have a wall behind us, if we've got something at our back, then we're going to come charging forward again. It increases emotional dysregulation for the reasons we talked about, because children don't learn distress tolerance skills early on. And we've all met those two and three-year-olds who have no distress tolerance skills. They're not expected to. So when they get mad in the store, they throw a complete all-out hissy. And that's what they do. It's up to the parents to help them learn how to regulate those emotions, impulses, and behaviors. Remember, with emotional dysregulation, though, people tend to experience things more intensely and take longer to get back to baseline than the, quote, average person. So something happens in the neurochemistry of the person, it, probably in the amygdala, when there is a disruption of this primary attachment relationship that can lead to stronger emotional reactions and more difficulty calming down than an, quote, average person. And insecure attachment can predispose a person to break down psychologically in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Insecurely attached, 
individuals may be less able to manage the distress associated with pain. Distress tolerance skills, if you haven't figured that out by now, are huge when working with somebody who is insecurely attached, when they start to fear abandonment or start to feel uncomfortable in a relationship, they need to learn how to be able to tolerate some of that distress. They're more likely to use emotion-focused rather than problem-focused coping strategies. Instead of fixing the problem, they're going to try to make their, their emotions go away, which can lead to um, addictions, like Marcella said, or any other scope of behaviors. They're less able to procure and maintain external supports. If they don't trust anybody's going to be there for them, then they're not going to work at developing those relationships. And relationships take effort. They take time. You can't just meet somebody one day and expect they're going to be there for you six months from now after you talk to them for 20 minutes. They're less able to form therapeutic alliances. Well, heck, in their mind, in their internal working model, we are no more consistent and reliable than anybody else in the world. So it's harder for them to trust us. And we need them to be able to feel like they can trust us in, a, in order for us to help them try to identify some of those core issues. They're less likely to adhere to treatment right recommendations. There was no explanation for this in, in the literature. However, my suspicion would be because of a lack of confidence or trust in other people as well as themselves, as well as the process. They don't see any hope. They don't see any way this is ever going to work out. So it seems futile to do this. So they're not motivated. One of the things we need to work on in addition to distress tolerance with people who are insecurely attached is motivation. Helping them see how this can work and things can get better and what the effects are going to be for them when they work through this issue. And they are more likely to evoke and perceive more negative responses from health professionals. People who are insecurely attached may be overly dramatic. They may be aggressive. They may be a lot of different things, but they tend to not be your ultra compliant, easy to work with clients. Anxious attachment occurs in relationships in which an attachment figure is sometimes responsive, but unreliably, so this is still insecure, placing the needy person on a partial reinforcement schedule that rewards persistence and proximity seeking attempts because they sometimes succeed. And the research on all of, all of this stuff is in your classroom. But what the, they're saying here is a, a partial reinforcement schedule means every once in a while when I need something, you're going to be there. And it feels so good when you're there. That just is really re reinforcing. So the next time something happens, then I'm going to try to get you to be there for me. And if you're not, I'm going to keep trying to get you to be there for me because I remember how good it felt. And if you're not, then... My world's going to kind of crumble. If you are, then great. So these partial reinforcement schedules, um, and, and we're not going to go into those in, in depth right now, are what keep this dynamic going in these anxious attachments and in these adult relationships where somebody is in a relationship and things are in that honeymoon phase. They're going well. And then things start falling apart. and then things go well again for a little burst and that partial reinforcement that little glimmer of hope is what keeps the person hanging on they're afraid to be alone but they're also not getting their needs met in this relationship so when they're in this anxiety limbo anxious attachment is associated with this dependent histrionic and borderline personality disorder characteristics covert narcissism is characterized by self-focused attention, hypersensitivity to other people's evaluations, and an exaggerated sense of self-entitlement. Socially destructive outbursts of anger are also not uncommon. You can see why they may have difficulty with forming relationships with healthcare providers. And they can be impulsive and demanding towards 
providers or relationship partners. These are the kind of characteristics that come out in, in anxious attachment. And when you look at the behaviors, if you took the time to break them down and look at each individual behavior and how it makes sense from that person's history, borderline behavior, that tendency to either love or hate somebody and the ability to just turn on a dime is, you know, all of a sudden you're not, you're not on the pedestal anymore, you're in the doghouse. Where did that come from? And how did that protect the person when they were little? How did being able to turn, flip that switch protect that person when they were little from either being overly emotionally overwhelmed or being hurt or whatever? Always look at the function of the behavior because I have yet to find a behavior that doesn't make sense in some way. People scoring high on attachment anxiety tend to rely on hyperactivating strategies to achieve closeness to others, support, and love, combined with a lack of confidence that these resources will be provided and with resentment and anger when they're not provided. So they want it, they want it really bad, they're anxious that they won't get it, and then when they don't get it, they're like, see, I told you I wasn't going to get it, and the world sucks and I hate everybody. Hyperactivating strategies represent fight responses to unfulfilled attachment needs. The person amplifies proximity-seeking strategies to demand or force the caregiver to pay more attention to him or her. Think about the, uh, one of the typical behaviors in borderline personality disorder when people are self-injuring. A lot of times that's non-suicidal self-injury. They're not intending to die. They're wanting to make the pain stop and or maybe wanting to get somebody to pay attention and it's a look what you made me do sort of thing. When maternal responsiveness appears inconsistent, hesitant, or unpredictable, children will often activate these hyperactivating strategies. This can also be the child who sort of melts down. They're not getting whatever their needs met are because they're feeling overwhelmed. They don't know how to articulate it, so they start to melt down. That is a hyperactivating strategy to get the caregiver to pay attention and help the little person get the reins on what's going on. Anxious preoccupied adults seek high levels of intimacy, approval, and responsiveness from partners and can become overly dependent. They tend to be less trusting. They're very anxious about this relationship. They're afraid of abandonment all the time. So they tend to be less trusting, expecting to be abandoned. They may have less positive views about themselves and their partners. That internal working model, again, they don't see themselves as valuable or effective. And they don't see their partners as trustworthy. They may exhibit high levels of emotional expressiveness, worry, and impulsiveness in their relationships. They've not been able to develop sufficient defenses against separation anxiety and will often overreact to the anticipation of separation or the actual separation from their attachment figure. So if you have a couple and maybe one person has, is going to be deployed or has to go on a trip, you may see the decompensation in the other partner when this is getting ready to happen. Anxiously preoccupied adults look way too far into things, whether it's a text message or a face-to-face -face conversation or the way somebody's dressing. Since they are always expecting to be abandoned or left or that somebody out there is better, then they are going to interpret nonverbals and verbals in ways that support their underlying assumptions. Evidently, they often seek a dismissive, avoidant partner, one who is willing to just, you know, whatever, you know, just let me go watch TV. In avoidant attachment, these relationships develop, or strategies develop in relationships with attachment figures who disapprove of and punish closeness or disapprove of expressions of need or vulnerability. So you have the parent that doesn't ever want to play with junior. It's always go away. I don't have time for you. I've got too much to do or it's just never home. Or the caregiver who when the child cries, 
says, suck it up or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, we've, we've all heard those things. In avoidant attachment, the person uses deactivating strategies as a flight reaction from a caregiver who is seen as emotionally unavailable. The child learns to hide or suppress expressions of emotions that the caregiver doesn't tolerate and deals with threats and dangers by themselves to avoid frustration caused by caregiver unavailability. They just avoid the whole issue. They avoid the disappointment. They avoid the conflict. I got this. So you've got little people who don't have the skills and tools to deal with the great big world on their own trying to deal with the great big world on their own. Avoidant attachment is associated with schizoid and avoidant disorders. Avoidant attachment is also associated with overt narcissism and grandiosity, which includes both self-praise and denial of weakness. It's the, I got this, I don't need anybody's help, thank you very much. Avoidant individuals often prefer to cordon off emotions from their thoughts and actions, presenting this facade of security and composure, leaving distress unresolved in ways that impair their ability to deal with life's inevitable adversities. When you don't deal with stuff, and all you do is stuff it down and stuff it back, it's kind of like putting all of your old clothes in a closet or toys or whatever it is, and you just keep filling that closet with stuff, and it gets harder and harder to shut that door and keep it shut. Same sort of thing with avoidant individuals. They are saying, you know what? I'm just going to talk the talk. I'm going to take those emotions and I'm going to put them back here. Well, eventually that gets filled up and it's got to go somewhere, which makes it more difficult for them to deal with life on life's terms. Dim dismissive avoidant adults desire a high level of independence, often appearing to avoid attachment altogether. They view themselves as self-sufficient and they don't need close relationships. They're just uh, too much effort. You bother me. They passively avoid relationships when they feel as though they're becoming too close, suppress their feelings dealing with conflicts by distancing themselves from partners with, of whom they often have a poor opinion, and have a great amount of distrust in others, but a very positive model of themselves. Remember that narcissism. With your dismissive avoidant adults, they just, they don't want to be engaged. They want people to just leave them the heck alone. They often cannot be convinced that other people will deliver emotional support, was never available before, why should I expect it now? They maintain their positive views of themselves based on personal achievements and competence rather than acceptance from others because in their history, they never got acceptance from others. So they're not expecting it now, and they derive their own satisfaction from this internal narcissistic model. Dismissive avoidance can also be explained as the result of a deactivation of the attachment system to avoid potential rejection. Rejection hurts, and it hurts a whole lot, just any time. But when you are a little kid, Oh my gosh, it's devastating. And when you are a little kid and it's your primary caregiver rejecting you, what does that say to you? Especially considering when you're a little kid, you're thinking in all or nothing terms and egocentrically. You're not thinking, well, you know, caregiver has some mental health problems or has an addiction and just isn't able to be there for me. A little kid's going, what am I doing that is making caregiver drink? What am I doing that made caregiver commit suicide? Why, what did I do? Fearful avoidant adults have mixed feelings about close relationships and desire a feeling and desire, both desiring and feeling uncomfortable with emotional closeness. So they want it, but it scares the crap out of them. They tend to mistrust their partners, hence the fearful part, view themselves as unworthy, Seek less intimacy. You know, I want to be with you, but I want to make sure that I can cut my losses really easily. And they may suppress their feelings in relationships. After class, when you're going through this PowerPoint, I want you to think about clients that you have and where they might fall on the attachment spectrum. Most of the time, you're not going to find anybody who fits really neatly into one or the other. Most people will have a couple characteristics of secure attachment and then fit 
you know, more or less into one of the other categories if they have an attachment disorder. But it is interesting to look and I was going through some of my clients and yeah, sure enough, I was looking at it going, yep, that, that sounds exactly like Jane or that it sounds exactly like Julie. Security priming. Um, now, there are, we've talked sort of vaguely about a lot of things that we need to do from distress tolerance activities to self-esteem building. Security priming was one intervention that came out that was so cool, and I wanted to share it with you guys. It includes using subliminal fi figures. Now, you can, um, but it also um, uses guided imagery, highlighting the availability and supportiveness of an effect of an attachment figure well we can help clients use guided imagery we can help them imagine that person being there for them we can help them envision times when that person has been there for them in the past it's happened you know let's focus on those times let's remember when that person was there and we can help them visualize the faces of security enhancing attachment figures both in their in their mind's eye we can also have them include pictures of these security enhancing attachment figures on their mobile devices pictures in their room where they can regularly see these loving secure faces around and and feel a sense of comfort and warmth and all that stuff security priming has been found to improve participants moods even in threatening contexts and eliminates the detrimental effects of threats on positive moods Additional tidbits, grief and loss, anxious attachment was associated with severe shame and guilt. Avoidant attachment was correlated with complicated grief. When there was a loss that was experienced, people who were anxiously attached felt like it was somehow their fault and they felt ashamed and oftentimes focused on all the things they didn't do. Those people with avoidant attachment, they had pushed them away. So there was a more complicated grief that was associated with that. Pain, physical pain. Attachment style characterized by avoidance of emotional expression may predispose individuals to chronic pain conditions. Attachment deactivating and, active, and hyperactivating strategies contributing to dysregulation of the stress system within the body subsequently contributes to pain sensitivity. All right, so how does that happen? When we get stressed, our HPA acts axis activates cortisol is dumped when cortisol is dumped norepinephrine is uh, secreted all of our fight or flight chemicals are are going rampant what things are suppressed one of the main things that's suppressed in this scenario when our hpa axis is activated is serotonin serotonin helps us calm down serotonin theoretically helps us be happy too but it helps us calm down and when we're in fight or flight we don't want to calm down but serotonin is also intimately involved in pain perception. So people with low serotonin, clinical depression, tend to have more pain. They tend to feel more pain. The relationship between PTSD symptoms and attachment anxiety is stronger for individuals with current PTSD symptoms associated with early life traumas compared to individuals with PTSD symptoms linked to adulthood traumas. So what that means is trauma in early life has a greater impact on attachment, potentially, than traumas that occur in later life. Postpartum depression. Attachment style is an additional risk factor for postpartum depression. And there is a strong correlation between insecure attachment, addictions, and eating disorders. The initial attachment relationship begins at birth. There's a critical period between birth and 18 months for that attachment relationship to form. Anxious attachment is associated with hyperactivating behaviors and maintained by variable reinforcement. Avoidant attachment is associated with deactivating behaviors. Both types of insecure attachment are associated with problems in mental health, physical health, and relationships. Chronic pain or mental health issues can both cause insecure attachments and be caused by them.
And security priming by, via visualization is one technique that can help clients feel safer and more secure.